Welcome to class, everyone. Uh, good to see you, some of you. I think uh, your the number of the third years um, have dwindled down considerably, right? You were more in number in the first year than I thought you, right? Yes. Now there are only ten of you all. Not sure what happened to the others. Okay, but you were more in number when, when I was teaching you all in the first year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, some of them have joined the e-learning. Okay. Okay, so let's begin with um, Romans. We were looking at uh, chapter 1 uh, on Wednesday. And um, verses 1 to see, uh, 6, sorry, verses 1 to 6 in Romans chapter 1. Uh, we see who Paul was. He mentions that he's uh, a born servant of Jesus Christ. He's called by God. He's separated. Then he goes on to share what he is proclaiming. That uh, the message that was proclaimed by the old, by the prophets in the Old Testament, which is the Holy Scriptures, uh, which is a message about Jesus Christ, uh, who was declared to be the Son of God with power and by resurrection, is the uh, message that uh, Paul says he is proclaiming. Paul also says that he is doing this by the grace and by the commission that God has given him. And uh, then he goes on to talk about his objective. What is his objective? Is to bring people uh, in all the nations to be obedient to the faith. Okay. And verses 7 to 17, he goes on to mention. Uh, why he's writing uh, to the uh, Romans, okay? Now, till verse 17, which we looked at uh, in the last class of Wednesday, is like the introduction. Now Paul is getting down to more serious things. He's talking about God. He's talking about the wrath of God. He's talking about, uh, he gives proof of the existence of God and how man denies that existence of God, or how man denies the existence of God, uh, and how he continues in sin, and then he goes on to talk about the judgment for uh, sin. So this is what he talks about after he gives uh, introduction, which is verses 1 to verse 17, and now he gets down to a little more serious things. So we look at um, verses 18 um, till the end of uh, the chapter, which is uh, uh, verse um, 32. Okay, so can somebody read uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, please? Romans 1 18 and 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who serve who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Thank you, Tarun. So here we see that God is not ignoring sin uh, that is going on in the world. God is angry. He is opposed to sin. Um, and uh, uh, we see how man ended up in sin or in the situation uh, that is it that he is in how did man end up in the sin or how did he end up in the situation that he is in uh, presently so Paul says that men have suppressed the truth instead of acknowledging the truth and uh, he says in verse 19 that God has made it plain he's made this truth plain he's revealed this truth uh, to us so how has God made this truth plain uh, simple, how has he revealed this truth to us? Um, he goes on to point that out in verse uh, 20. So can somebody read verses uh, 20 and 21 and 22, please? Verse, <clears throat> verse 20 and 20, up to 21. For this invisible, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Verse 21, for although they knew God, 
They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Amen. Verse 22 as well, Charles, please. Thank you. Okay, verse 22. Um, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Thank you. So here we see in um, how does God make uh, this truth plain or reveal this truth to us, uh, Paul points out to creation. He says, uh, in creation, you know, we see the invisible attributes of God. So in creation, the invisible attributes of God, you know, are clearly seen. It's being understood uh, by the things that are made. So when we look at creation and we see there is order, there is perfection, there's beauty, there is design, um, you know, we cannot but, uh, you know, uh, know that or understand that there is a God behind this who brought about this perfect order, this, uh, this beauty, this uh, uh, grandeur, uh, this magnificence, uh, you know, this, this, this perfect design, uh, everything um, which is being put in display in creation actually reveals the invisible attributes of God. So God's invisible attributes of God can be clearly seen, can be clearly understood by the things that he has made. Uh, or God's invisible attributes has been revealed to us through uh, creation. Now, take for example, um, you know, uh, uh, one of God's invisible attribute is God is infinite. You know, He's infinite. His wisdom is infinite, and we see this in the universe that He has uh, created. There's so many millions of stars, uh, millions of galaxies. Uh, you know, there are so many different. Uh, also, it can be so many different universe like, other than the universe that we have uh, in in. Uh, the planets, uh, so many different uh, 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 planets in the uh, solar system, you know, uh, which we haven't, man hasn't even, uh, you know, seen or known. Uh, but, you know, when we look at the vastness of God's creation, uh, the greatness uh, that, you know, we're so limited even in our understanding of it. Uh, we just see God's invisible attributes, his infinite wisdom. So also other attributes of God are seen uh, through nature, through creation, through the things that he has uh, created. So many people say, you know, if there is a God, let him reveal himself to me, you know. If there's a God, let him reveal himself to me, and then, you know, I will believe that there is a God. But the Bible says God has already given us enough evidence, you know, uh, and that evidence is in the things that he has made. And uh, creation reveals the invisible attributes of God. So people are without excuse. So Paul says people are without excuse. They can't say that they do not know God because creation is a big signpost that there is a God. Okay, so God makes Himself uh, known to man through His creation, and creation is is an evidence that, uh, and it's an enough evidence or a good evidence uh, that there is a God and that He exists. Okay, verses twenty one and twenty two, um, Paul goes on to say that even though people uh, looking at creation. Uh, you know, they know that, you know, this just cannot come out, this whole creation, uh, the way that it's uh, created, there's so much of uh, brilliance in this, uh, it's so great, uh, you know, it's so perfect, there has to be, it's such a masterpiece, there has to be a creator behind all of this creation, there has to be a creator behind this brilliance, behind this great vastness of this universe, behind uh, the perfection, the order that is uh, uh, there, the design that is there. Uh, and that is, you know, there, there should be a creator and that is uh, God. So, you know, um, people, even though they knew this, they knew that creation is so great and it's so brilliant and so work of God. But in verse 21, he says, they knew God, but they did not glorify him as God. And because they did not, glorify him as God, they became, their thoughts uh, became very futile, became very vain, and their uh, foolish hearts, uh, you know, were darkened. Um, and, you know, uh, they professed to be wise because, you know, they tried to find different scientific reasons, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, 
to prove how creation came about, uh, different theories, um, you know, different things that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, that were there. But, you know, uh, professing to be wise, they actually, uh, you know, became foolish in their understanding. Okay, they knew, but they chose to become foolish in their thinking. They chose to become uh, fools. Yes, Shri Kumar. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, I just want to know um, uh, the twenty-first word when when he says that when they knew God, and uh, they, so is he speaking about um, Jews or is he speaking about the whole humanity that they knew God? Because the um, the G God was never revealed to or. It, that's my understanding that God has, uh, you know, in that uh, the, in that true manifestation, how we revealed to the Jews, uh, He has never revealed it to uh, to the Gentiles. So how they will come to know that when they see the creation that there is a true living God, you know, they how they will come to know that there is a truth when when that truth was never uh, spoken to them or they were never knowing that. So they found that every creation is God. So. Why the Paul is saying that they, even though they knew God, but they have not purified? Is he speaking to the Jews or uh, is he speaking to the entire humanity? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, good question, Sri Kumar. Um, uh, uh, yeah, coming, I'll come to you, Charles. Uh, good question, Sri Kumar. So here we know that the Roman church, uh, the church at Rome, comprised about, of Jews uh, and Gentiles. And of course, you know, Paul goes on to talk about. Uh, specifically to Jews and Gentiles in chapter 2 where he's talking, uh, you know, the Jews have the law, uh, you know, but uh, they will be judged according to the law. But what about the Gentiles? You know, they did not have the law. So how will they be judged? So Paul says you have your conscience. You know, your conscience is is, uh, is, a, is a law within you. But God has put in your heart to know what is good and bad or to what to know what is uh, good and evil. and uh, But he's saying, you know, you'll not be judged with your conscience and with the, the law, but you will be uh, judged according to the gospel. Now we, we look at that. So he's basically writing to both uh, Jews and Gentiles. And he's saying that, uh, you know, for anyone, you know, maybe even speak, speaking to the Gentiles, uh, they did not know God, they did not have the law, they did not have the Torah, but, uh, for anyone, people are without an excuse. They cannot say, uh, and we know that you know Paul is not basically addressing uh, this whole letter to uh, some problems that uh, are happening in the Church of Rome. It's a very general letter where he's talking about uh, uh, doctrines, which is uh, which you know, which is more specific to any. Um, uh, any uh, any group of people, not specifically to a church, like he addresses uh, in Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Corinthians, to specifically uh, to the churches. But here it's uh, he's talking, you know, he's writing about doctrines, and he's saying that you know people are uh, without an excuse; they don't have an excuse that there is no God. Because when you look at creation, you can't say that it came out by a big bang. You can't just say that you know who gives scientific reasons, or uh, you know you can't. Uh, uh, you know, worship these uh, created things because in themselves they are, uh, you know, cannot uh, uh, give, uh, uh, you know, they cannot sustain themselves, uh, they cannot come to life by themselves, but there is a creator who has created them. So creation itself, and I think it's 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 not the, the wisdom that, uh, you know, is, uh, is getting them to think about it, it's, it's, it's God himself, or, you know, the Holy Spirit speaks. Whether you are a believer or unbeliever, the Holy Spirit speaks. So the Holy Spirit uses a conscience in an unbeliever to convict them of what is right and uh, wrong. So it's the it's God who also reveals to them through creation that there is a God, that uh, there is uh, uh, you know a God who created everything, created everything in such perfection, such beauty, and it just cannot come uh, you know naturally or automatically. You know there is uh, somebody who has created it, and that is God. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Um, Charles says, Pastor, what could be the vivid examples uh, of verses 18 to 23? Uh, can you give me more clarity on your question, Charles? Yes, yes I, am, I, am, I am looking at the word of God being revealed at that time through Paul 
to the church in Rome, but could there be some examples, for instance, on verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools. So could there be some vivid examples today where they have, they show the, the maybe the church or the people are showing foolishness as if they are thinking they are wise. That's what I meant, Pastor. Okay, good question, Charles. He actually goes on to speak about uh, things in specific. He's building on, it's like a, you know, more like a, like a logical uh, reasoning that he's bringing. First, he's talking about, uh, you know, that there is a God who's proving the existence of God. And then he goes on to actually uh, talk about uh, how mankind became more sinful is because, first of all, he says that, you know, that, uh, uh, that they, uh, uh, you know, uh, God revealed himself through creation, but, you know, they, uh, uh, they refused uh, to accept him as God, and hence their foolish hearts were darkened. And because their foolish hearts were darkened, uh, it led them into more uh, spiritual or uh, degradation or um, into more evil, into more corruptible uh, behavior, which he goes on to talk about in verses 23 to 27. So uh, in the... If you ask me of examples in the in our uh, uh, present world, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, homosexuality is such a big, which he talks about uh, this in the in the verses uh, to verse thirty two, the end of this chapter. He's talking about uh, homosexuality, okay, and um, you know how uh, people have, uh, uh, you know. Uh, beginning to see this as natural and they are kind of, uh, you know, uh, impressing it upon the society, impressing upon the church that uh, this is how God created them. This is uh, how naturally, uh, you know, they're created and hence they need to be accepted. Hence they, uh, you know, uh, gay or homosexual, homosexual marriages have to be accepted in churches. They can become leaders. They can become uh, pastors of the churches. Uh, so, you know, um, this is one way that, you know, is corrupted uh, the hearts and minds of people. So that is what he goes on uh, to build on and talk about in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the upcoming verses. Did that help, uh, Charles, or uh, can I understand your question? It did, it did. Thank you so much. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, we can talk about homosexuality, uh, you know, uh, even there's a lot of... Um, uh, live in relationships where you, um, it's okay for us to, uh, uh, you know, live with that person and, and know if the person is compatible with that person. Uh, we can get along with that person and then we get married. Uh, also, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, premarital uh, sex that is happening. Uh, uh, and it's it's acceptable because people say it's, it's okay. What about uh, abortion, which is a big thing that's, uh, that's, uh, that's happening in the U.S. and uh, you know churches have accepted it. Uh, divorce uh, is another thing, and you know people have um, exchanged the truth of God's word, and they're kind of believing the lies because they're saying if you're not uh, able to live with that person, it's okay for you to divorce and to live with somebody that you're happy with. Uh, if you don't want this child, uh, abortion is uh, totally okay. And that's why he Paul uh, actually begins this uh, whole section is talking about the wrath of God as being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. They they suppress the truth, they know what is right, they know what is wrong, they know what is good, what is evil, but they suppress the truth uh, because uh, they want to live that unrighteous life. And, uh, and God is not ignoring sin, Paul says. He's angry to it, he's opposing to it, uh, he opposes sin. And how does, uh, and you know, I ask this question, how did man end up in the sin, in this situation? Because they have suppressed the truth. Instead of acknowledging the truth, they have suppressed the truth. That means, you know, they leave God out of the whole picture. They leave God out of the whole equation. They leave God out of their own whole life. So, uh, you know, uh,
God, I want you to just be that provider. I want you to help me. I want you to heal me. But these certain aspects of my life, I want it to, uh, to be left out. So also in the church, there are some aspects that we involve God in. There are some aspects uh, in church life where we uh, leave God out of the picture. And, uh, and hence Paul is saying that, you know, uh, when we do that, we're in the danger of suppressing the uh, truth and um, you know when we suppress the truth we continue to live in unrighteousness and um, and you know uh, uh, we indulge in every wrong deed. So did that help us? Yes it did. Yes it did. Thank you. Okay. So we see that you know creation reveals um, that there is a God. It's evidence enough that He exists. And then Paul goes on to talk about uh, how you know um, uh, you know they they worship um, uh, corruptible things instead of worshiping God and glorifying Him. So he talks about that and the consequences of them. Uh, you know, refusing to glorify God, refusing to uh, acknowledge that He is God. Uh, how did it uh, end up? It ended up in a very sinful, very evil lifestyle, uh, which was, uh, you know, which uh, led them to all wild passions and to dishonoring God with their uh, bodies. So, verses 23 to 27. Can somebody read that, please? Romans chapter 1, verses 23 to 27. Romans chapter 1, 23 to 27. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, so here we see in this verse, Paul is saying that, you know, uh, even though they knew that there is a God, that they did not glorify him. And instead of worshipping him uh, and glorify him, they looked to corruptible things. Corruptible things means things that will pass away. And uh, in the process, they likened God to a man, to animals and to creeping things. And what did God do? You know, God chose, um, you know, to give them up uh, to their uh, own sinful ways. Uh, because man chose to do this. Uh, you know, he knew, God knew that they did not want to glorify him as God. So two times in this passage that uh, we just read in verse 24 and verse 26, it says, God let them go. Okay. Uh, God is actually saying that if this is what you want to do, this is what you think, fine. Okay, even though he, this was not what God's plan for them was, this is not what God want, wanted for them, this is not what God expected or desired for them. But uh, God knew that you know this is what they like, this is what they were going after. Okay, and God said, if this is what you want to do, this is what you think. It's fine. And, um, you know, God gave them up and he let them go. Okay. Yes, Elisha. Yeah, Pastor. Um, my question is, um, God having given up on them, should it also be a case for us to also give up on them and not preach the gospel to them and not pray for them? Because we think that uh, God himself has, has given up on them. Should that be uh, our position? Okay, uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's not that God gave them up in the sense that God wanted them to, you know, eternally uh, be destined to hell. Uh, the word of we always need to look at uh, 
uh, interpret one scripture in, in the light of other scriptures. The other scriptures tell us that it's good God's good, pleasing and perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of um, Jesus Christ. Okay, And even if you look at in Romans, in uh, the other chapters where uh, Paul is discussing, uh, it looks up, he talks about, you know, uh, God choosing us. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not, uh, and then we can think about, you know, God chose certain people for certain tasks, certain people for uh, salvation, certain people to be destined to uh, to hell. But that's not the truth because the word of God says God is not a partial God and he wants all men to be saved. So how do we uh, explain what Paul writes in the in the, in the the other chapters, uh, you know, that certain people were chosen for certain things and certain people were not, um, is we we need to interpret that in the light of uh, who God is, that he's not a partial God, he, want, he wants everyone to be saved. Um, but also we see that, you know, um, uh, uh, it's a choice of men. It's not God choosing us, but God knew even before the foundations of the world, who will choose him and who will not choose him. So he already knows uh, who is destined for salvation, who is destined for hell. So it's not a choice that God makes, but even before he created the world, even before we were formed in our mother's womb, God already know the choices that we will make. And, uh, you know, he gives us up to our own will and choice. That is why uh, it says in Genesis 1 that he created us in his image. He created us in his image means that, you know, uh, God is perfect. He created us perfect. God is sinless. He created us sinless. God never dies. He created us never to die. God has a mind. He gave us a mind. God has a will. He gave us a will. And he respects our will. Okay, that is what we see here. He respects uh, uh, that we are free moral beings, that we have a will, that we have chosen. It's because he created us in his image and son. But does God uh, uh, guide us, instruct us uh, what to choose? Yes, he guides us and instructs us. Uh, does he let us just... Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, be destined for hell. No, when Paul is writing uh, to Timothy, um, uh, he says, you know, uh, give them up, or in, I think it's even in Corinthians, he says, uh, you know, put them out of the church. You know, uh, uh, such people who are doing uh, immoral, living immoral uh, lives. Uh, and in in one passage, I think in Corinthians, somewhere he says, you know, give them up to Satan. Uh, what does it mean? It's not that uh, you know, uh, okay, throw them out to church, you know, give them up to Satan so that they can end up in hell. Is you know, when uh, when we sin, God actually basically removes. We learned it in healing and deliverance class. If you remember, God removes His hand of protection over us. Uh, because we don't want to be under his protection. He removes his hand of protection over us, but for a reason. It's a loving God. It's a good God. It's a compassionate God. And what is the reason why he removes his protection? It's because we chose not to be under his uh, guidance, his leadership, his protection. But when we are out of his protection, you know, uh, we um, uh, we go through this. That's when Satan... Uh, you know, uh, brings in you know, troubles and difficulties. And uh, so when we go through troubles and hardships and difficulties, uh, we then realize, oh, you know, why is it happening to me? Oh, it's because of my sin. It's because I've gone against God. And that will bring us back to repentance. That will bring us back to God. But Paul also talks about this in um, in Romans chapter 2, where he's, you know, he's saying, he's talking about, uh, you know, uh, yes, we have the truth. We have to, uh, uh, you know, confront people with the truth. We have to condone sin. But he says in in chapter two that you know God is um, uh, is um, is is good. Uh, the goodness of God leads to repentance. Okay, so the goodness of God is uh, leads to repentance. Second uh, Romans chapter two verse four. He says. You know, don't despise the goodness, patience, and the long suffering of God because the goodness of God leads to uh, repentance. So even when God is correcting us, so he removes his hand of us, uh, he, uh, he's doing it for a good reason so that, you know, that can lead us to repentance. So uh, what do we do with uh, homosexuals? You know, when he's talking about homosexuality here, you know, do we throw out, throw out people who are uh, indulging in homosexual behavior from our church? No, we don't do that because we, how do we deal with it? Uh, love and truth. We love them for who they are. 
but we don't love the sin, just like God loves the sinner but hates the sin, and he deals with the sinner and deals with his sin, wants them to come to repentance, uh, so we also love the person. And uh, what do we do? We, uh, we show them the truth. But to show them the truth, we don't force the truth upon them. We have to be, you know, we, uh, they are free moral beings, just like God treats, respects us as free moral beings. He gives us up. We also give them the, the opportunity, whether they want to uh, listen to God's word, what God's word says. And if they want to, we show them the truth from God's word. And we show them the truth from God's word, and we don't impose God's word upon them. We don't impose the truth because it's uh, it's the Holy Spirit who works in them. Now, salvation in a person's life is not because you and I preach uh, so beautifully, or it's the power of the way we preach, or it's our power, but it's a work of the Holy Spirit in their life. So we just take them to the truth, we show them the truth, and we let the Holy Spirit and we let uh, Jesus uh, work in their lives and minister to them. So did I answer your question, Elisha? Um, yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Good question. Okay, so we'll move on. So here we see that, you know, God lets them go. Uh, and it, uh, you know, even though it's not his desire, that's what he wants, uh, how he expects for them. And this shows us that God respects that we are free moral beings. That is what he did even at Adam, Adam and Eve in the Garden of, uh, uh, I was going to say Garden of Gethsemane, in the Garden of Eden. You know, God gave them up and he let them uh, go. So what did he give them up to? He gave them up to their uncleanliness, um, you know, um, uncleanness, and how unclean man can get. Paul goes on to you know, talk about that, illustrate that. He said they dishonor their bodies among themselves. And when God let them go, they went all the way to an extent of extreme, uh, uh, you know, uh, of extreme uh, uh, thing of dis dishonoring their bodies among themselves. The extent, uh, what was the extent was the extreme of, uh, of dishonoring their own bodies among themselves. So in verse 25, uh, he says what he actually uh, in verse 25, he says, We exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. He's actually, uh, you're talking about what he meant in verse 23. Remember when when he said they're studying the book of Romans, we have to have the forward look and the backward look. So in verse 25, what he's uh, talking about there is what he actually uh, meant in verse 23. So what did they do when they changed the glory of God for incorruptible things? Verse 25 says, you know, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Okay, so they worship the created things rather than the creator. Uh, God. And in verse 26, he says, for this reason, God gave them up to wild passions, for even the woman exchanged the, the natural use of what is against uh, nature. So he goes on to explain what he meant by saying that they were dishonoring their bodies among themselves. He says in verse 27, that women exchanged, you know, uh, passions, sinful passions, or lustful passions with women and men with men. Uh, now, this was the climax or, or the high point of being wild in their passions and dishonoring God in their bodies, the ultimate of uncleanness and being wild. Now, we know that uh, you know this whole thing about homosexuality is such a big issue in our day and time, but we also know it was back in the time of Noah, uh, also in Paul's time, and the Bible is very clear about it that this is wrong. Okay, uh, many churches are uh, accepting this; they're accepting this these people as natural. Um, there are many uh, such people, or even leaders of the church, uh, pastors of the church. But uh, the, we go according to what the Word of God says. Word of God clearly says that this is uh, wrong. And in verse twenty-six, it says it's wild passions, and it's against. God's natural design. These people are actually trying to prove that 
you know, they're very natural in the way uh, they are. It's how God created them. So we need to accept them uh, as well, the way God created them. But, uh, you know, it, the word of God clearly says that this is not God's natural uh, uh, design. Okay. So uh, there's a demand all over the world for homosexuality to be the norm, for, for homosexuality to be normal. But here we see in the Holy Scriptures, just as Paul mentions that these are Holy Scriptures, that this is not normal, this is not God's design, this was not his plan, this was not what he intended, and it is dishonoring our bodies. And our bodies are the temple of the living God, we need to honor God with our bodies, and this is basically dishonoring our bodies. Okay. Then we move on to verses 28 to 32. So can somebody read verses 28 to 32, please? Verse, <clears throat> verse 28 to 32. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they knew Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Amen. Thank you, Charles. So here we see that uh, people chose not to retain God. They chose not to worship God. Uh, you know, um, and we see that God gives them up to their own desires, to what they think, what they want to do. Um, uh, we see this even in our day and time, um, you know, and here in, um, for the third time, God says, you know, he gave them up in verse 24. We say, we see that God gave them up, he gave them up to their own uncleanness, uncleanliness in verse 26. Uh, we see again that God gave them up. He gave them up to wild passions. And we read here in verse 28 again that, uh, you know, uh, God gave them up. He gave them up to a mind that is corrupt and that is going in the wrong way. And then because God gave them up to their own uncleanliness, to their own wild passions, uh, gave them up to, uh, to a mind that is corrupt, um, and going in the wrong way, uh, we see, you know, uh, how they they lived, how sinful uh, they lived. And in verses uh, 29 to verse and to verse 31, uh, Paul lists out all the uh, things that you know, uh, the wild passions, the corrupt mind, the uncleanliness, that uh, the sinful nature that people were involved in. And Paul goes on to say that all those who indulge in this kind of sinfulness and white passions um, and who are living a corrupt mind and uh, living unclean lives, Paul says they will face judgment. Uh, they will face judgment and there is eternal consequences for all of this and that is eternal death. Okay, so that is how he ends this um, chapter. He you know, first talks about um, God, the wrath of God, he talks about uh, um, that, you know, um, God has revealed himself. Then he talks about um, the proof of God's existence, how man denies that existence, and how because he denies the existence of God, he doesn't want to worship God, doesn't want to glorify God, how he ends up in such a sinful situation, such an unclean situation, such uh, a, in such wild passions. And then uh, he goes on to talk about uh, the sin and uh, the judgment for sin, and that is how he ends this chapter. Okay, any questions on chapter one? Uh, Pastor, I, I don't have a question, but I am uh, 
I am looking uh, closely on on the last part of the chapter one, verse twenty-four. Uh, Paul writes, "Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts, impurity." And then in a, in verse twenty-six, he says, "For this reason, God gave them up to to dishonorable passions." In verse 28, he says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debased mind. So I'm looking at the way um, Paul is using the, the, the adjectives, um, the lusts of their hearts to impurity, um, they gave them dishonorable passions, but also debased minds. So that's what I was uh, trying to, to carefully go through. And uh, in every part that he is talking about, he is giving examples and he is clearly giving um, how those things are happening. And uh, now I can clearly see the answer to my question, which I had asked earlier. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles. Summing that up, uh, summing that up, uh, yes, in verse 20 says, uh, 28, he says, debased mind, uh, which he's talking about a corrupt mind, a mind that goes in evil ways and sinful evil passions. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? If there are no questions, then uh, we'll just uh, look at the introduction for. Uh, chapter two and then we can continue on uh, looking at each uh, you know um, topic wise uh, the different um, sections that he's dealing with in chapter two before that we will look at uh, the introduction now in chapter two uh, paul deals with the issue of law and conscience uh, both with the jews and gentiles now, this is like, uh, you know, something uh, that Paul is debating in his own mind uh, or he's debating within himself, keeping in mind his readers, okay? The people are going to read this letter that he's writing to the church at Rome consists or comprises of both the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, so he's here talking about this whole issue of law and conscience with respect to the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, for the Jews, they had the law, and the Gentiles, they did not have the law. So the whole question was, how is going, God going to judge the Gentiles? Now, the Jews are going to judge, be judged by the law because they have the law. Then how are the Gentiles going to be judged? And Paul says that there is a law that is built inside every person. Okay, And uh, uh, there are two things. There's reason and there's conscience. Okay, um, again, I repeat that. Paul says there is a law that is built inside every person, uh, basically those who don't know the law. It's a law that is built in every person and the two things, reason and conscience, which means that within every person, the way God designed us, he's already given us two things, which tells us about God and tells us what is right and wrong. And that is the reason and conscience. So those who don't have the law have reason and they have conscience. But Paul says that everyone will be judged according to the gospel, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. So uh, first of all, lays this foundation. Yes, the Jews have the law. They'll be judged according to the law. The Gentiles don't have the law. So how will they be judged? Do they have reason and conscience? That is uh, uh, an inbuilt uh, law within themselves. But Paul goes on to say that both the Jews and Gentiles will not be judged according to the law and they will not be judged according to the reason and conscience, but they will be judged according to the gospel. So I'll explain that a little more when we are uh, looking at uh, uh, the verses. Okay, so can somebody read uh, verses 1 to 4, please? Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Anyone? Pastor, can I read? Sure, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, sober thou art that judges for, wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself for, 
thou that judges does doest the same thing but we are sure that the judgment of god is according to the truth against them which commit such thing and thinkest thou this o man that judges them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of god or despise it thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering not knowing that the goodness of god leadeth thee to repentance thank you Thank you. so um, thank you mr kumar um, now in chapter 2 uh, paul is basically challenging the attitudes of jew towards gentiles is presenting an understanding of god's judgment how what when he's revealing the work of the conscience and he's presenting what a true uh, jew is so in this chapter we will take a slightly different approach uh, when looking at this chapter when examining this chapter instead of examining this chapter verse by verse uh, we will just look at uh, you know the main insights being presented in this um, chapter Okay, so uh, he was, you know, Paul in chapter one. He says how sinful man is because he has suppressed the truth and he has gone away in his old wild passions and thoughts of his corrupt mind, um, and therefore he's telling that man you are inexcusable. And then he goes on to talk about, uh, you know, that even if uh, you know you're judging someone else. you are inexcusable now he's basically speaking to the jews because you know jews uh, you know they have they were they taken they taking pride or they were taking pride in this fact that they had the law they had uh, the covenants uh, for the laws were the laws that god had given was for them the covenants was for them uh, so they knew the laws they knew the covenants they also were teaching the laws um, and the paul is saying what's the point you know you know the laws you you have this pride that you are the only people who have the laws the covenants you are also uh, you know it and you're teaching it to others but what's the point you know because you're not keeping the uh, the law it's totally pointless and he says god is also going to uh, judge you on this and so he says you know, we can point to the gentiles saying that they are doing all of these things um but Uh, Paul is saying that you know what you are, how you're living is also inexcusable, because when you judge uh, others, you will also be judged by the same standards. Okay, and in verse three he says you're doing the same thing. You cannot escape the judgment of God. He's telling the Jews, uh, and so he, then he goes on to say that everyone, whether you are Jew or Greek, uh, Gentiles, you are going to be judged by the life. you are living because there's no partiality with god but he says in in verse 10 he repeat he says you know the jews first then the greek in verse 9 in, in verse 10 he again says jews first then the greek so he says we're all going to be judged so we cannot point our finger at others because whatever uh, you know point we are pointing our fingers at others we're also doing it ourselves and hence he say we are going to be judged by the same standards now we'll just close by looking at verse 4 he says you know he says don't despise the goodness the patience and the long suffering of god because the goodness of god leads you to uh, repentance so we need to think about this you know we need to think about this phrase the goodness of god leads us to repentance the goodness of god leads you to repentance the goodness of god leads a person to repentance yes god is a god who's a god of justice he's a just god he demands judgment for all the sins that we do but how does god deal with sinful man paul says that the goodness of god leads to repentance god will judge sin but you know god is really trying to do uh, this so that he can draw people in his goodness his mercy his forbearance and his long suffering okay so even when in his judgment even by judging sin god what god is really trying to do is he's trying to draw people to his goodness mercy forbearance and long suffering so when we uh, you know when we're dealing with the issue of sin and sinfulness with people whether it's in our own family um, whether it's in our offices it's in our workplace or whether it's in our ministry or whether it's in our church um 
you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, we need to uh, extend the goodness of God that it leads to repentance uh, to people. We must demonstrate the goodness and mercies of God. Uh, having said that, it does not mean that we condone sin, that we overlook sin or we encourage sin. No, that is not what I'm saying or that's not what Paul is saying. Uh, we need to deal with sin. But we also need to demonstrate the goodness and mercies of God because we know that it's the goodness of God that leads to uh, repentance. And that is what he uh, you know, goes on to talk in verses uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. So Paul is talking about that in, in chapters, uh, in verses, sorry, 1 to 11, where he's saying that uh, you know, we're all doing the wrong things. We'll all be judged for the wrong things we are doing. But he says, Jew first and also the Greek. And then he's saying, so don't point your finger at others because you yourselves are doing things that are wrong and you yourselves, uh, you know, will be judged. So we cannot judge others. Okay. Yes, something at the hand up is Kumar. Hey, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, I just want to know that uh, when Paul is saying about the judgment here, is it the judgment on sin or is this a final judgment? That is one thing, because um, um, as a man who is in Christ, so so the God judge him through as you as we discussed that you no know, the God use the same um, measurement or uh, you know to judge the judge everyone. So that judging is for the sin, but especially when we are in Christ, uh, can God judge us um, without Christ because our judgment is already um, passed or uh, you know Jesus has already took. Or if this judgment is the final judgment, then how that also how it is going to be different, uh, 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 how it can be the same. That's my question. Hope. Okay, thank you for your question. So the first part of your question is, is this the final judgment? Yes, Pastor. Uh, is that no. is speaking about the final judgment or is it speaking about the sin actually? How no, God... it's not the final judgment because here it says in verse 4 that, you know, uh, that is the goodness of God that leads to repentance okay so uh god is and then he also says that you know uh, god is judging sin uh, so that people we can bring people to repentance people can experience the goodness mercy forbearance and long suffering of god so this is not he's not talking about the final judgment but he's talking about uh you know uh, that each one of us all of us are sinful and God uh, deals with that sin and we can't escape the judgment of um, God. And also, yes, it's also inclusive that, you know, don't think that uh, because you are a Jew, you have the law, you have the covenants, uh, you know, uh, you have the circumcision ritual, which, uh, which is, uh, a na you know, which God initiated as a natural covenant uh, that, you know, um, uh, you know, you want you will escape the final judgment no it's also saying that you can't judge people you know in the sins that they're doing now because you will also be judged because you're not keeping the sun and also these are not the things that is going to save you because paul says it's not uh, the law it's not the conscience it's not the reason that we will be judged by but we will be judged by the gospel of jesus christ thank you pastor that did it answer your question uh Sri kumar Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, yes, there is a judgment that happens, the wrath of God that comes even as we sin, but there is also final judgment. And, you know, uh, we can't think that because, uh, you know, uh, we are saved and, uh, you know, uh, we receive salvation, just like the Jews, that, you know, there won't be that final judgment against us. We will be judged if we go away from the truth. You know, Hebrews says that, you know, when um, we treat the, the blood of the covenant as an unholy thing, that is, there's no more, I think it's Hebrews 6 or 8, I forget. There's no more forgiveness of sins left, but, you know, a, a, a fearful judgment from God. So we don't know what is that extent, uh, you know, um, that we can go to, that even as, as we say, when we go back, we fall back, we will, yes, we will still be uh, judged in the final judgment. Okay, thank you. I hope I answered the question, Sri Kumar. Yes, Pastor. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining class. Uh, have a blessed uh, Friday and a blessed weekend. And see you all next Wednesday. Thank you.